afternoon. How are we all doing? Um, so, to be perfectly honest, the reason this talk is called this is because I really wanted to do the wrong trousers from Ardman. <laughs> so I've had this image for ages and just trying to, and then built a talk around using the image. <laughs> so, um, so we'll see how it goes. Um, so, yeah, so, so this, this is a part of the talk. So I'm old <coughs> and I've been doing this stuff for a really long time. And, um, and, I, and I tend to work with lots of people who've been doing this stuff for a really long time, who are quite old themselves and all kind of look like me. Um, and that becomes a theme throughout this talk. Um, and under no circumstance whatsoever should I ever be mistaken for a developer. And I also don't use Drupal, so God knows why I'm here. <laughs> um, so basically, I, um, I've had all these jobs. I've had, basically, since about 98, like even when I didn't manage people, I got called a manager. So I've been all these things. And now I'm a product manager, basically. So I, I spoke here, I spoke at a previous one of these events a few years ago while I was still working in government, um, where I was head of digital for a big government department. Um, but then there was a little referendum and a change of government and that wasn't quite so comfortable anymore. So, um, so I left and I do something different now. So um, I'm still kind of obsessed with this idea though which again is why it's a bit strange to be at a business day, because I'm obsessed with this idea of the internet of public service, which is this idea of um, doing all the things and working on all the things that need to be done, but don't make money, basically. Uh, and open source is part of that, but kind of Wikipedia and open content and this whole wider world about the fact that there's lots and lots of things that have been lost in the last kind of decade on the, on the web, basically because there's a constant search to make some money and to have the latest um, social network for dogs or something. And the kind of, I've never really been interested in that, which is why I chose to work in government. And now I, um, I work in this thing called Civic Tech. And it says that, I'm not gonna read it. It's, it's basically Civic Tech exists because a guy who made an enormous amount of money from PayPal decided he should give some money back. So basically every civic tech company in, on the planet gets funded by the Omnidar network, which is basically his money. Um, like we pretend, we pretend otherwise, but the reality is, you know, it's basically a hobby for a billionaire in California. Um, and I work for this organization. I work for an organization called My Society, who in the UK particularly were the first organization to do this kind of work, um, being around for about 14 years. Um, I'd wanted to work for them for a really long time, but didn't get on with their founder very well. And, but he moved on, so I got a job. Um, <laughs> and this is our mission. So we build the tools that give people power to get things changed. So the whole idea of everything that my society does, all the projects, that, all the work for hire that we choose, all the projects, platforms that we run ourselves, all the charity work we do, is about... Um, empowering people who need that opportunity so they can change the people who have power over them, so they can affect things. And, that's, and that was what I was quite excited about, and that's why I joined the organization. Um, no one here is really old enough. This is, um, yeah, there's a couple of us. This is Wolfie Smith. Wolfie Smith said it best, power to the people. Um, and, it, and basically, this dreadful um, sitcom from the 70s had such an enormous impact on my life that looking back, it's really worrying. But, um, <laughs> But um, he also is essentially the, um, the original Jeremy Corbyn, essentially. So everything that's happened since is basically inspired by Wolfie Smith. Um, and these are the things that we do. This is what we say we do. We understand power and how to use it. We give people tools to influence those with power. And we use that influence to make changes in communities. Um, but we'll get back to this, and about, this about whether this is really true. Um, we're in lots of places. We're not as big as Drupal, but we're in about 44 places in around the world. The map's wrong. We're like in Iran now and not one of the others, and we're in Argentina, and we're not in one of the other bits of South America, but we're still in about 44 countries around the world. Um, we, we've just done something in Iraq, which is quite strange. Um, we do these three different things. So we do, um, we do lots of stuff about freedom of information. So we're the biggest provider of, um, of freedom of information requests to government in the country. We do a load of stuff. So we have a thing called Every Politician, which literally is a data set of every national politician in the world. So what their role is, what their party is, their contact details, everything is one great big JSON file. 
Um, and then I run um, what we call Bear Cities, which is Fix My Street, basically. So um, if you've ever complained about a pothole or about fly tipping, there's about a 70% chance you use the app I'm, the product I'm responsible for, which is this, which is this. So if you're in Bristol, who actually is from Bristol here? Is it mainly Bristol? So Bristol City Council use Fix My Street for their complaints. Um, so um, fly tipping or anything wrong with the roads or anything like that all gets put through Fix My Street. Um, I mean, around a decade, so it's, it's lasted pretty well. There's been like a million reports through it. It's, it's kind of national. Um, we've got ones all over the world. Um, the most recent nice one, oh, I didn't get to go. The furthest I've been allowed to go is Essex so far. <laughs> um, and we've just launched something in, in the Dominican Republic. And one of my developers got to go and I didn't. And that's just poor. <laughs> Um, but yeah, we've got them in, a lot, in lots of quite cool countries and quite interesting places. Um, and it's all open source. So everything we do is, um, has been open source since day one. Um, everything's through GitHub. Um, it's one of those quite strange things because it's a product for us as well. We also sell it and we have these relationships. But we, um, we don't have anything in our um, commercial version that we don't also offer in the open source. It's in Perl. So those of you who know Pearl, like so. So basically, we 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 we've, we make it commercially viable by no one wanting to fucking touch it. <laughs> <laughs> and at the moment, I'm trying I'm trying to hire a Pearl developer, and God, it is not it is not been fun so far. Um, <laughs> but it's been around a long time. It's ten years old, and um, and we missed a window. We missed a window about four years ago to to um, to replatform it basically, and now we're in. We're in it now. <laughs> um, platforms well, like, <laughs> I wanted it all to be in Cold Fusion, CFML. It's the last thing I was any good at. <laughs> so I, I thought that might, you know, at least I could contribute occasionally then. Um, but this is the whole point. So this is the absolute goal of Fix My Street, is as a resident, I need to report something bad to my, on my street so that the council fixes it. There's a reason we exist is to do this. Um, we existed, at, we, we, and we set this up long before we spoke to any councils. So, um, and this is job to be done. I gave this talk at a um, agile thing about some other stuff, so the, some of the slides are a bit weird. Um, but this is the point, see, and this is the weird thing about Fix My Street. Like, actually, we do very little of it. So, like, the bit in green, so something's been vandalized. So, I see something vandalized. If it's graffiti, I just take a photo because I love it. But if it's anything else, I probably complain. Take a photo, make a report. So we don't do anything there. We do a bit of processing and send it to the right people at the council, and we put it on the map. <coughs> but that's all we do, because then the council has to do all the work or ignore it, depending on the council. And then the citizen gets back and chases it up. We don't chase anything up either. So actually, we have this weird thing where we're barely even the middlemen. We've built this whole process around basically just making sure that we understand how councils operate because no one else does. So it get, so the email or the thing goes to the right place. That's essentially, you know, when push comes to shove, that's all we're offering. I and mean, these are some of the challenges that we've been facing. So 10 years is a kind of long time. Um, there's only, at most, there's only ever been, until really recently, there's only ever two devs working on it, even on all the international projects as well. So people use it and kind of, set it up themselves in these 44 different countries, and there's lots of installs of it. But um, open source is open source, so like most people essentially, you know, what's it, 80% of people just take, and like 1% of people contribute back. I mean, it's a really kind of thing like that. Um, so it's old, so it predates um, the iPhone. So if you describe it without anyone knowing what it is, they will always assume it's an app, and we hate apps. So we built a website like the year before, about several months before that there was an iPhone. And, we, and basically when everyone really didn't use things on, light, on their phones very much. Um, and we have pretty successful apps in, all the, in the various um, app stores, but we really, no one wants to work on them. Like whenever we've got someone complains, like basically the developers draw straws about who's gonna have to deal with it. Um, this is how old it is as well. So this is, this is the last time I actively used Drupal. Anyone remember which version this was? It's not, it's five. 
So this is the last time I did it. This is why I still have kind of painful flashbacks when I come to this event, because this is the last time I worked with it. Um, but it's old, so we've been around a long time and everything's moved on and we didn't necessarily keep up. Um, yeah, and like 60% <coughs> of, of all the reports that get made now get made through the app. Um, and like I said, no one wants to work on the app or on any of the apps fundamentally. Um, and that's a, an ongoing issue for us and that doesn't seem like the change because we're quite, uh, again, everyone's kind of my age, everyone's kind of old school open web people involved in the organization. They're, they're quite passionate about all of that and they are uncomfortable with native apps. I'm not exactly different. Um, and we've never really had a roadmap. The guys who were talking about the roadmap before, organizationally, I came in and said, where is the roadmap? And everyone just laughed at me. And then someone set up a spreadsheet, which was basically just tickets from, from um, GitHub, like in a random order. So that's the roadmap. Because basically all that's happened for the best part of a decade is whichever, and it's not even who shouted louded or who had the money, whichever international team we liked most, <laughs> the ones who asked nicely on the Google group or who we've met at a conference, we did what they wanted. <laughs> and, we added, and we added those features to the product. And for the most part, they're the right features and it's continued to build, but there's, there's never been any prioritization. There was never any kind of focus. We just kind of did it based on yeah, they're all right, and they're a pain. <laughs> and that's basically what's happened. Um, and like, I'm not making any accusations about Drupal, but um, this is my main my main name. There's no ever been any designers being allowed to touch Fix My Street, particularly until really recently. And that might have been something I felt about Drupal in the past. Um, and I mean, really, like we've have a, we have de designers, but there was never any UX thinking or any kind of design thinking, and and features get added, and then we deal with the consequences, basically. So you're always <laughs> going to backfill in. And then you can't ever really fix anything, so you're just trying to make the best of the kind of the UI all, all the time. And that even includes, it's like Jared Spool, who's kind of a famous US guy, he's doing this thing at the moment saying everybody is a de designer. And if that's true, I'm fucking dreadful. <laughs> <laughs> so like that, you know. So I've got opinions, that doesn't make me a designer. <laughs> <laughs> But despite all this, despite all the challenges we've had and everything, and I can say this very comfy, like we've made it massively easier to do the most British of all things, complain. <laughs> uh, fundamentally, <laughs> we made an app that makes it, uh, which is by far the easiest way of any of the ones that are out there at the moment to complain about things in your local neighborhood, basically to your council. So it's got loads of flaws and there's loads of things I'd love to change, but. It's still much, it's easier than any form that you'll find on any council website that's just been set there because they're set essentially to discourage you from reporting it, um, and particularly as austerity hits. But, and this is where things get a bit interesting. So this is the business bit. So, you know, councils are like that to us, basically. The councils do not want to talk to us. We spent seven or eight years overwhelming them with thousands of reports from citizens complaining about potholes and dog mess and graffiti and fly tipping and all sorts and abandoned vehicles and all this stuff. And we never asked them if we could do it. <laughs> we never discussed it with any of them. You know, we literally, initially, we scraped all the email addresses off people's websites. We didn't even get in touch to ask. And then we crowdsourced the ones that were missing. So, um, so, they, so they love us, <laughs> fundamentally. <laughs> Um, so then we decided we needed to raise money because the charity stuff was growing, was drying up. So we decided, oh, I know what we'll do. We'll sell to councils. <laughs> so we've got an army of councils whose heads of digitals and heads of highways have nightmares about us. People, at least two London borough um, heads of highways lost their job based on how bad it looked in, on Fix My Streets because there was campaigns about the fact that there were so many uh, unclosed reports. So yeah, we're massively popular. But at the same time, what else have we got? <laughs> you know what I mean? So we have to kind of do something. So we built a product based on um, making it much easier for them to manage all the stuff we said. So we created our own market, essentially. We created all this stuff hitting them, and then we created the only way they could actually deal with it. <laughs> Which I'm pretty sure some kind of people in Sicily worked out years ago, but, um, but, we, but, but we're in it for the good. 
Um, so we, yeah, so it's the whole poach your turn gamekeeper thing. But we have to be quite careful because all of our reputation is based on being the voice of the citizen. So we can't now look like we're actually in the pocket of the council. So we have to run this kind of balance. And actually, the real reason, you know, despite all my jokes, is it's all very well us having this these nice kind of maps with loads of little pins saying where all, where there's all these problems. But if the councils aren't engaged, the problems don't get fixed, and then what's the point? You know, unless we actually do something with the councils and get them on board, it was all a waste of time anyway. So we had to get them to take this stuff on board. And this is the and this is the true user story. Like, the council has to clean up in a timely manner. That's the whole point. Otherwise, everyone gives up. Like the users add things to the app, add things to the website. If they don't get a report from the council saying they're sorted, then why would they ever do it again? Um, and, the, and there's the other thing is like, most council people care. And they care because the press do. <laughs> <laughs> and they care because voters do. And, they're, and increasingly because their insurers do. One of the things we've discovered is most of our um, uncaught, our, un, our interactions with councils that we, which we didn't lead are because their insurers have, have said, look, someone's suing us because they tripped or they broke their car on a, on a pothole when I was saying it was reported two weeks ago. And increasingly, people who haven't actually damaged their cars go on Fix My Street, look for potholes, and just get in touch with councils and say, I damaged my car on, on this pothole that you haven't fixed in the last two weeks. Because there's a photo of the pothole, and all the details about the pothole are there, and then the council half the time just just pay up. I'm not saying this is a business model. <laughs> um, and they care because Westminster do, there's money, with, you know, central government still funds a lot of local government, you know, there are often campaigns there. And they care because actually, you know, most people who work in work for councils care. That's why they work at councils. They're not there for the goodness of their heart these days because it, because it's fun. Like it's been a hard few years working in local government, and if people are still there and are still doing these sort of roles and stuff, it's almost certainly because they're passionate about something, and so they do care. So you can deal with them at that. They've never got any bloody money. So that's another thing. What a great thing to try to sell to, you know. And that is the thing, so this is the challenge. So the only way to meet user needs is for the councils to, to efficiently respond to the reports. So we have to build those relationships and we have to constantly have those relationships. But the reality is councils have got less money every year and reports grow, grow every year. So we're just in that weird hockey stick moment suddenly because the, the, the more austerity that hits, which means the less litter pick up and the less roadworks and stuff that's happening through the councils means there's more things to complain about and more people now complain on the web than ever before. Like if we were on social media, if we just let people complain on Twitter, it would be a, it would be a firestorm, it'd be crazy. <laughs> but at least we add an extra bit of detail into it. But it's really hard and it's a hard ongoing conversation. And this is the point of the talk now, so that's all just there. <laughs> so here's the thing. So one of the weird things about my society is that a few years ago, we've been doing all this work and we've had all this investment. And we're funded by, as well as Omidar, but like we've got money from Google and the Hewlett Foundation and various other people. And we just did all the, um, after the election, if you're on Facebook and the next day it came up and said who your new MP was and stuff, we did all of that for Facebook and things like that. So we've got money from all these different people. But we had never, we had no, imp no kind of evidence of whether we were having any impact at all. So we actually hired a team, we stole some staff from Cardiff University and they're proper academic researchers who actually sit amongst us, actually looking at our work all the time and researching it and running surveys and doing interviews and doing kind of data analysis to see if what we do is worthwhile doing. So there's a, a, a check on it all the time. And it's pretty rigorous, that, you know, it's all, everything's then um, published in proper academic papers and in, and, in, in, in proper articles and stuff to keep us honest and to make sure that we're doing this for the right reasons and we're doing it right. And there's this really important report. So this, who benefits from, from civic tech? Um, about 18 months ago, um, and it was UK, US, and um, Kenya, I think, were the countries where we investigated. And um, it's a great report. It's worth, it's worth having a nose. It's, it's pretty well written, but it's interesting because this is who uses our, our stuff essentially. So they're middle-aged, white, male, degree-educated, 
and either in a, a decent full-time job or they're retired. So basically, there's this idea of male, pale and stale, <laughs> which also looks surprisingly like this. <laughs> And, and just so aside, it's not much different than um, this has changed slightly with the new election, but not as much. So, um, so it's pretty much the same. There's a few. It's like, there's slightly more women, and there's slightly less white males this time, but it's really slightly. It's like two percent each way. So we design for ourselves. So, like I said before, like everyone looks like me. Like you go to a civic tech conference or a tech for good conference. There's a lot of beards. So a lot of shaved heads because we're bold and we don't want to admit it. <laughs> and everyone's white, pretty much. And everyone's pretty middle class, university educated, um, working for the same few organizations, either doing it on the side because they're privileged enough to be able to do stuff on the side, or really pr relatively well paid for it. And everyone does user research and everyone does that kind of um, service design sort of thing and everything. But the reality is you're always inspired by your own experiences. And this is the problem we've got. So where we are at the moment is we've spent 10 years building a really slick channel to empower people who are empowered already, essentially. So the reality is the evidence tends to suggest that the people using our tools were the people previously who probably knew the phone number of their MP or their councillor. They certainly knew, knew who they were. They knew, they knew the processes. They knew how to get things done. We've just made it easier for them to get things done. We haven't made it any easier for all the people who always struggled previously. And there's one of the things, like, so another piece of research that an American university did based on UK data shows this really weird tick up in reports just before every election, whether that's local or national. Because people know that if they put pressure on their councillors or their MPs, their MPs or their councillors will put pressure on the council and things will get done. Only certain kinds of people know that that's possible, but it happens consistently across the UK. So again, we're just making, we're just making it easier for, for people with authority to, to reuse it. Um, so I grew up, so Bristol I grew up in Southmead. It's one of the most deprived areas in, in Bristol. Um, I still just live on the edge of Southmead. Um, you don't really ever leave. You just have to accept it. <laughs> It's one of the most deprived areas in the city. And, and because of that traditional Bristol thing, no deprived area is ever very far from a really well-off area. It's just the way that the city's built. So, so this is all the reports over um, six weeks in um, Southmead. And lots of people go through, so this is, um, so everything basically, potholes and trash and um, fly tipping and everything. And it's the same amount of streets as this in Clifton same t time period, same stuff. Actually, there isn't a thing in Southmead where people have got less access to mobile phones or, or 4G or kind of smartphones and stuff. They're not deprived in that way. But it's just, but it's, it's about expectation. So if you live in Clifton, if you've paid 700,000 pounds for a bloody flat, you see something wrong in, your, in the street and you complain about it, you expect it to be done within 48 hours. In Southmead, they don't expect it to ever get done. So it's a vicious cycle in, these, in the more deprived neighborhoods. Like, no one thinks anything's going to get fixed. So nobody reports anything. So nothing gets fixed. And it just goes round and round and round. And so this is what that thing I did at the, at the slide at the beginning. So we help citizens to understand who has power and how to use it, give them the tools to influence those with power, use that influence to create change within their own communities. But actually, we help educated white middle-aged men <laughs> from good neighborhoods do all those things. And that's not what any of us got into it for. That's not the point. Um, and I, you know, it's been tough doing the kind of stuff we do recently, you know, since the Grenfell stuff particularly. Like we, we're involved with housing and doing kind of stuff for housing and things. Just like nothing we've ever done has ever, would have ever helped any of those people. You know, none of those people ever knew how to, to take the stuff that we've done to push the power to make the changes that would have saved people's lives. Because it, it just never touched them at all. Like there was a few people blogging, but, they, but it, was, it was hidden away. People didn't know about it. 
So you have to find ways to actually to do these things like who who are the people we really help, what impact do we really have, and more importantly, like you know the reason we did the stuff with Facebook because it was not a fun experience. Like I mean, I'll tell you this, so don't tweet this, but never worry about Facebook having your data. Because after having do, done a data project with Facebook, it was such a bad experience. And the data they fed back was so poor that you've never got to worry about what they're doing with it. Because they <laughs> fundamentally, like, I'm, I'm pretty sure there was some 14-year-old with a spreadsheet in like Excel 97 trying to deal with it. But, but we had to do something to reach more people. You have to go broader. We can't just talk, be talking to the same people all the time. And this is, this is all tech for good stuff, all this kind of, you know, it, it's all just kind of very monocultured, and we have to make, find ways to make changes. And I've got no idea how. So that's why I'm doing these talks, <laughs> to see if anyone else does. So, um, so we're trying to change things. We're working with Citizen Advice Bureau. We're doing stuff with the big lottery. We're trying to get out there and meet more people. I'm doing stuff with the council here in Bristol around the kind of clean streets thing and getting out. Um, I've become a trustee of a charity to try and learn more about the kind of the real problems. But you know, we just need to be better at doing this sort of stuff. And that's it. Thank you. Um, I can answer questions. I think I think I did 25 minutes. Something like that. It's usually half an hour, but I, I skipped a couple of slides. <laughs> so anyone got questions? If not, I'm quite happy to go back to work. <laughs> and by work, I mean to the bar. <laughs> oh, right, OK. Um, I'm quite ignorant of things like Perl, but I just wondered, it's an obvious question. If you're interested in people taking up the software and using it in a serious way to, as, as part of the whole process of um, digital democratic participation, why are you not using something like Drupal, for example? So we're not that interested in people picking up the software, to be perfectly honest. We're interested in people using the software that's there. So that's part of the reason. And how does the software become available for them to use? Well, in the UK, we've been running it for 10 years. And I'm only really interested in the UK, right. to be perfectly honest. <laughs> <laughs> but also internationally, so, so there was a big question. So um, no, to, to be less kind of, again, right. so the big question four years ago that I said when there was this window, yeah. it was the big question of, about what to move, whether there was an opportunity to, to move to something where things could be picked up. And it, and it essentially came down to the fact that it would have been PHP. Um, but at the time, that, that there was neither the resource or the ambition, essentially. So, so kind of strategically, there was a, there was a, there was a thought that that was that was the right way to go. Um, we didn't have any PHP people in the community, essentially, um, and randomly, internationally, Perl still actually used a lot more. It's still taught in a lot more computer science courses. It's still out there a lot more than it is in the UK or the US. Um, so. That bit of it isn't like the bit that's hardest, the bit that we, we really need to do better. It's getting up and running. That first bit is really hard. We don't seem to find it so difficult for people to then to add features and to make tweaks and stuff. But we've never kind of got it to that point where it's kind of containerized or something enough that people can just spin it up. I mean, like 80% of the questions are about the first 5% of the work, basically. <laughs> I, um, I've been involved in, a, I mean, well, in Drupal, and so many of us have these idealistic backgrounds, and uh, uh, there's a lot of great examples of the technology being the great equalizer and, you know, payment gateways in Africa that use non-smartphones and so on. And, and, you know, possessing one of these things in our society doesn't seem to be a barrier anymore. And I'm just sort of wondering what the background is behind the fact that it's only these can this this our privileged class so to speak still using this stuff if there's any idea about the why does it go 
is there any understanding of <clears throat> what the what the problem is, what the barrier to adoption or use is? So part of it, in certainly in the UK, anecdotally, and we're only early in the research, is it gets lost. It just gets lost in how much stuff there is out there, is the reality. I mean, so in that report that I mentioned, the stuff that was, I think, was Kenya, Kenya or Nigeria, but, but actually civic tech stuff gets a really, is a, has a much broader <laughs> use space, has a much more awareness of the kind of the tools that they were talking about on a kind of percentage of population basis than anywhere in the US or the UK. And there's a lot less people doing it because it isn't, it doesn't get, it doesn't kind of disappear in the whole kind of the space that we have here. Right. Then there's the other classic story that, that underprivileged people have a lot of other stuff to worry about to survive every day. And my yeah. wife, t my wife talks a lot about, uh, you know, people with too much time on their hands, then, you know, being able to get into other people's business. So it could just be, <laughs> it just could be that story. Again, a classic British thing as well. But, um, but, but also part of it is the, is the kind of vicious circle thing, is the trust thing as well. The, um, based on a certain background and based on a certain set of privilege over, over, as you grow up, you believe the government and local government and councils and are there to help you. They're there to support you. They're there to make things easier for you. If you've come up in a different community with different sets of challenges, they're there. To, they're there to send bailiffs around. They're there to get in the get in the way. They're there to make your life miserable so that so they don't trust them. It's, and the same, you know, it's a much bigger issue with the police. But it's a it's a similar. They're, they're, your relationship with authority is quite different. So there's not a lot we can do about that. Fundamentally, I mean, it's a, it's a broader societal issue. But that's part of the thing. So even if they're aware, um, it kind of get you know they, they don't necessarily think anything will happen, so they have that kind of distrust. And also we missed, you know, not just us. Like when I say we, I mean the whole kind of thing in this country and in the states. Like I'm friends with a lot of people who do this stuff in D.C. and New York and things. Um, you know, we spent an awful lot of time talking to each other about how to do this stuff, and and didn't ever talk to anybody who actually you know. We talked about how certain parts of society needed the help. We didn't talk to any of those people. We didn't find out what they wanted. We built stuff that we thought was best for them. We were as bad as anybody else. And now we're at least aware of that. And now we're trying to do things differently and start from a, a different place. Like one of the things we've learned recently is like, particularly for people now, like everything we do is based on the fact you've got an email address. And people don't have email addresses anymore, or don't know what they are, or don't ever check them. So it's just kind of fun, like having to find a way to make people's identif their main identifier their phone number, particularly in kind of Africa and stuff like that, is is a major change. Like architecturally for the system, it's a big it's a big <coughs> shift, but it will make a huge difference for the amount of people who are able to immediately use it. Um, so yeah, so it's, a, it's an ongoing challenge. Is, is there a um, so civic? Is the, um, so kind of talk, following on from what uh, Jam said, the kind of empowering of the already empowered, um, is there an issue perhaps with civic technology and the funding thereof, that the funding's frequently for the technology, but not for advertising the technology or educating people that it exists? Yeah, um, and have you guys as an organization talked to your funders about, for example, uh, employing a marketing agency? or an advertising agency to go down to some of the more deprived areas and to talk to them about what their expectations could and, uh, and uh, could be. So I think there's, so it's definitely part of the problem. Absolutely. It's part of the problem that um, we haven't, that the funding is based, so the funding's weird anyway, so the funding's often about the technology. But actually it doesn't, but it also doesn't often f force you to be part, to partner with actual civic non-tech organizations so actually there's all these charities out there that do good stuff no one says you know you can have 500 grand here but you can only have it if you work with these people here who aren't great at technology but actually know their users yeah and we've never been pushed into that and that's only really this year starting to change and some stuff's been done with kind of bringing agencies in and things like that i think i think we're still we're still a step away from that in it that, that actually we need um we need like user researchers and we need like people who can kind of like um, 
ethnographic kind of research is to go in and find out what the problems are. Because if we send people in who are about advertising the tool still, we're still one step. We're, we're not, we just need to make sure we're, we're offering the right things. And the reality is, if bloody the councils and the government did this stuff well, then we wouldn't need to exist. And I, I think that's, that maintains, that's, a, that's a fundamental thing. Oh, sorry, that's me. <laughs> and that's, a, and that's a, an ongoing fundamental thing of all of this. I mean, we only exist to fill a gap that probably shouldn't be there anyway. And, and that's, a, that's quite a bit, like, it's, it's just a silly thing, but in Bristol at the moment, there's a, a campaign about clean streets, about trying to encourage, because they've cut all the funding for street cleaners, so they're trying to encourage people to clean their own neighbourhoods and stuff. So we are a little bit involved in that. And they've got an agency involved in helping it and stuff, except completely from, from people who are in Bristol, who are pretty switched on, have started, a, not aware of, have, have missed it completely, have started their own hashtag about the fact they're worried about their neighbourhood, and they've, and they've just created this whole offshoot without any awareness. Now, there's just, and there's just no join up, because actually things just got missed, because no one actually spoke to people about what actually was the problem. And the clean streets thing just has just gone past everybody. I was just wondering. This is, you know, a very niche area where you're targeting, you know, a very specific problem. But what other areas, or if any, are you looking to move into? For example, recently we've had the the tragedy in London with the tower, and there were a lot of problems with the council organising that relief effort. There were a lot of charity groups, or a lot of different organisations doing things. Is there other things that this sort of civic software could be doing to coordinate things like that? There's definitely, um, like, when there, uh, like there is what, what there is we don't know. It's part of the problem. So, um, Grenfell's, in, in whole massive parts of kind of civic society generally, the whole Grenfell disaster, is, as, as a, there's a lot of soul searching going on about what, what could have been done, what should have been done after, um, what does it tell us about what we've been achieving previously, and there's a lots of conversations that, uh, in a classic kind of so lots of people came together after it immediately and, and started building apps and stuff <coughs> in, in London um, but again they just started building stuff because it was it was their reaction to it they didn't really speak to anybody about what was needed we needed more bodies on the ground and that's the thing about a lot of this when there's things like that actually a lot of the time is you need people to go and help but actually you know software might be eating the world but it's not always the solution is the reality, um, but we, but we, but I think it's like we, the reason we're now working with civic with um, citizen advice because citizen advice like, obviously know what questions they get asked from people, and the fourth leading kind of set of questions they get is about housing anyway. Um, so we've already started having conversations about what we can do to help them come up with some products and some kind of prototypes. Because also they've got access to the people, so we can actually get to talk to the people with the problems before we start writing them down code for a change. Um, and obviously everything's accelerated now to try and make that stuff happen, and that's that's um, and that should, will be interesting. But it's but there'll be a lot of profile, and it'll be quite hard. I think is the reality. Yeah. Um, 